That inspired my entire life of political activism. And I think similarly, Sunila's life of activism was also inspired by the social revolutions of the 60s and the 70s, by people standing up uh, to demand their rights. And beginning to identify ourselves as women as also people who have those rights. In a wonderful article written by Kumi Samuels, also a part of the Sangat community from Sri Lanka and a close friend of Sunila, she's written an article called, We Were Feminists First, Sunila. Uh, and it's an article about Sunila's early days in feminism in Sri Lanka. And I love the fact that she began her activism, as many of us did, uh, with a pamphlet that she wrote with Kumari Jaywardena, another incredible South Asian feminism, uh, and distributed about the myths of women that they bravely distributed at a May Day rally of the left in 1975. This is the seeds of speaking up for yourselves as women, uh, of questioning the myths about women in the midst of the social justice struggles of their time, and gradually from that pamphlet and leaflet for which many of their um, comrades uh, chastised them, they went on to form later the Women's Action Committee and many other groups, including Women for Peace and groups that fought the struggle in Sri Lanka for overcoming the civil conflict, the ethnic conflict, uh, and defending the rights of the Tamil uh, minority in the midst of one of the bloodiest civil wars of our era. Sunila always urged us to take on the difficult questions. She was never satisfied with easy answers. She always asked us to think about the theoretical debates, but she always asked us to think about what did they mean in a very practical way for our struggles. And one of, I think, the most important things she always stood for was the understanding that you must build your theory and your activism in coalition and alliances with others who also care about those issues because you cannot build a movement that makes change on an exclusionary politics. You have to build it in a politics that also embraces those who are different than you and those who continue to struggle in other ways. And she urged us to do this no matter what the difficulty. In that sense, um, she embodied what in feminist theory we call the politics of intersectionality. The politics of caring about the intersection of all forms of oppression, of race, class, gender, sexuality, age, disability, all ways in which people are oppressed, and understanding that you cannot build a movement for change by excluding anyone else. You must embody all of those things in what you do and what you stand for. To Sunila, this was not feminist jargon. To Sunila, to Sunila, this was something she put herself on the line for, something she risked her life for. To her, it was an ethical and a political necessity to speak out against discrimination in all its forms and to work to transcend differences so that women and men could organize across borders and speak to the full human rights of all. She often paid a price for being at the forefront of many issues, for fighting relentlessly against discrimination and persecution, whether based on people's politics, their race, their ethnicity, their nationality, their culture, their class, their gender, or their sexual orientation. In particular, as the violent repression and terrorism increased in Sri Lanka in the late 80s and early 90s, she assumed the leadership of INFORM, the Human Rights Documentation Center, for which she is best known, and she was denounced as a traitor to all sides because she called for accountability from all sides for the violations of human rights that they had committed. And many of us feared at that time for her life. In fact, she lost many friends in that struggle who took that same principled stand. Uh, and she always reminded us that when you've lost so many friends, Anything else you lose, whether it's your purse or your passport or your uh, coat, is of no significance compared to what it means to lose your friends in struggle. 
But in spite of all those losses and bravery, Sunila was one of the most joyful people I ever knew. She did not live in fear. She did not live with the heaviness. She brought to life a continual search for the joy, for the connection with people, and she sought out opportunities to know the world better, to know differences better. Even as a teenager, she spent a year living in California um, on a student exchange program where she, so, where she learned a vast knowledge of U.S. popular culture and folk music, which she often sang, and I have to say to my own embarrassment, that she continually embarrassed me that I didn't know the words and I couldn't carry a tune. Um, but she could sing the songs of my youth. Um, and this was the kind of joy that Sunila brought to us, a joy that transcended boundaries. When she studied women in development at the Institute for Social Studies in The Hague, she chose to live uh, in an apartment with a Jamaican and a Peruvian that she had just met be, instead of sticking with her national group. To my great fortune, that Peruvian was the woman who is now my life partner. So I had an opportunity to meet Sunila at a very early stage in her life. She then went to Peru uh, and spent four months on an exchange program, again embodying her third world politics and solidarity through personal connection, through learning about the movement in Peru and the struggles that were happening with the Shining Path and beginning to make connections between what was happening in Peru and in Sri Lanka. She lived many times outside of her country, sometimes in exile, sometimes by choice, uh, in The Hague, in Kuala Lumpur. She traveled endlessly to conference, and everywhere she went, she knew something about the people and the history there, but she also soaked up the local culture and the local life, and exhibited her playful relish of the joys as well as the contradictions of life. She loved fine art and popular culture. She loved haagen pistachio ice cream, which we always had to provide her when she came to New York, as well as string hoppers, which women around the world tried to find for her when she was outside of Sri Lanka. And she loved politics and gossip. Um, even amid her busy political life, she found time uh, to know what was happening in people's lives. And she would continually uh, keep up with the latest movies and read um, books that I would discard, um, or she would leave in airports. And she would, of course, break into song, as you have heard. I say all of this because I think when someone gives up a promising career in the arts to become a political activist, it tells us the depth of their commitment, but it also means that she brought the same joy that she had in song and arts into the movement to remind us that arts and culture are a part of politics, uh, are a part of the life we care about. Sunila is perhaps best known for her work in human rights, and I want to talk now about why the work on women's rights is human rights that she did and I did and many women around the world did together um, was, I believe, so important and what it still means today. One of my best memories of her, which embodies this work, was walking into the cafeteria um, to get a coffee in Geneva at the UN Human Rights Commission in 1992. The first time I had ever been there, the first time I had entered the UN in Geneva, or entered any part of the UN besides going to um, NGO activities at the women's conferences. Uh, and I was there to try to find out information about the 1993 Vienna World Conference on Human Rights that Ava mentioned and how we could try to influence it as women, as women, how we could get women on that agenda. I had no idea how the commission worked, but I got a friend to get me in, and I was there. And I was feeling very alienated and discouraged by this male-dominated environment, um, and wondering, did I really want to do this work trying to influence the UN? So I went to the lounge for a cup of tea, and I ran into Sunila. I hadn't seen her for probably two or three years. I had no idea she was there. Nor did she expect me to be there. In fact, she looked up with great surprise. And we both breathed a huge sigh of relief that we had ended up in this place that neither of us had ever thought 
we would call home or see as our political work. And in particular, because she was there testifying and organizing around human rights abuses in Sri Lanka and trying to bring them to the world's attention through the UN Human Rights Commission, she was able to teach me and to teach all of us who began this global campaign for women's human rights how to work in the UN, how to keep your feminist politics while you go to the UN arena to bring those issues, and to understand the technical language of UN treaties and UN bodies uh, in a everyday simple form in terms of thinking about, as I now say, the UN is simply a global version of your local town council.